So, good evening everybody, and welcome to this Wednesday evening's program. It's very nice to see you again, those of you who are returning. And for any new faces, welcome. And also to those of you watching over the uh, Ustream, uh, we are happy to see you. And uh, whether you're watching it live right now or later, you are very welcome to join us for this lecture this evening. My name is Jack Corley, and I'll be talking this evening about the fall of man Part 2. Uh, those of you who were here last week or watched it on uh, Ustream will realize that we spoke about the issue of how evil began, to put it very simply, and how we human beings have found ourselves, find ourselves in a world of conflict. And uh, whereas most people seem to think that uh, it's an issue of, you know, injustice, poverty, uh, race, and a host of other things, we see the fall, of the, the uh, root of evil to be much more fundamental, and a lot of these issues to be more symptoms of a deeper cause. So, uh, last week we explained that in the fact, uh, right at the beginning of human history, there was an original couple, which in the Abrahamic faiths is understood to be uh, the Adam and Eve, who were to be the models for God in creating an ideal family. They were meant to be, in a sense, the prototype of the ideal family. However, due to the interference from the archangel Lucifer with Eve in a sexual union, uh, Eve betrayed God and also betrayed Adam, and later seduced Adam into a physical sexual relationship in a premature way, and uh, plus the fact that she herself was already stained as a result of her relationship to Lucifer, then both Adam, Eve and Lucifer, all the people that, uh, the beings that God trusted, actually were cut off from their creator. And because this couple were meant to become the true parents in history, they could not set that example. They became false parents. Their children also turned out to be false, meaning that uh, they now had also sin as part of their inheritance. And of course we know that uh, the first son, Cain, murdered his younger brother Abel. So this was obviously a very tragic start to human history, and so we've been suffering the consequences ever since. Now a lot of people who have heard this story or read this story, they um, may take it at face value that it was the literal eating of a fruit, or at the very most, perhaps just an act of disobedience, irre irrespective of what the act was, but simple disobedience was the problem. Of course that's true, but we also see that uh, there was an actual act which severed our relationship to God and which results in our present day people being born with original sin. And so this kind of situation leaves, of course, many unanswered questions, such as why was it possible for Adam and Eve to deviate from God? Um, did God know that they would deviate? And if so, why did he then allow it to happen? Perhaps he could have intervened, perhaps he could have stopped it, so these are among the many questions people ask, and some of the questions we'll be dealing with tonight. So I hope that uh, you'll find the presentation to be interesting, inspiring, informative, and uh, useful for your personal spiritual life. So let's begin with this. It's uh, part uh, two, the fall of man. So how was it possible for Adam and Eve to fall? And this is, of course, a question which I think many people, many conscientious people ask this question who believe in uh, one or other of the Abrahamic faiths in particular, or just conscientious people in general who ask questions about the existence of God. How is it possible for evil to come into this world if the creator that we believe in is meant to be only good? How then do we find ourselves in this situation? So I want to refer you back to one of the points that was made in an earlier presentation about the issue of growth. Uh, everything over time grows. And so, for example, with the, uh, mature, the, the world of uh, plants or animals or other creatures, um, they do not simply appear fully grown. They are born uh, you know, as a very small and sometimes helpless creature, but over time they grow to what we would call perfection, which means that the, all of their organs and their body uh, fully function as they were meant to. That's could be uh, and have matured to their fullest extent. That uh, 
is, I would say, the definition of perfection for, for example, animals. In the case of a tree, let's say a fruit tree, the point where it bears fruit is the point where it has reached perfection. But that obviously doesn't happen instantly. It takes time. And it follows the uh, principle of the, the uh, principles of growth and so on. Now, in the case of our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, we have a situation where uh, they were, of course, their bodies were designed to grow pretty much automatically. I think all of us understand this. Of course, we can affect, to some degree, our bodily growth if we overeat, if we undereat, if we don't take care, basic care of some of the things we should be taking care of, uh, then our body, of course, can be affected. But generally, we do not control, fundamentally, our body's growth. That is something that is preordained, in a way, or predestined based on our genetic makeup. Now, in the case of our spiritual growth, it's different. We do have control over the way we grow. And so here we have a situation where there is a certain period where Adam and Eve, our first ancestors, were in a period of what we call indirect dominion. What does that mean? It means that they were not able to yet communicate fully with God. God was not able to directly communicate fully with them. But over a time period, uh, they had to follow a certain command or principle through which then they would come into a relationship with God where they would no longer need commands. It would be actually love, the love of God would guide their lives and would be in fact uh, the rule in their life. And so if Adam and Eve had actually followed the principle, obeyed the commandment and reached the level of perfection or oneness with God, their creator, then they could not possibly commit some unprincipled action. It's like if you are absolutely, totally in love with somebody, you would not want to harm them. You would do everything possible to care for them, to love them and to express your love for them. Uh, you know, you would not need rules, in fact, because what would govern your relationship is love itself. That is the highest law. And so, in other words, the principle guides us towards this perfection. However, there is one power which is actually stronger than the power of mere principles or commands, and that is the force of love. You know, human beings, we all, I think, understand this, we are primarily emotional creatures, not always rational. And so, even though we may be able to understand rules and regulations or principles, often what is it that influences most is actually the power of love or some other emotion. In other words, we are influenced often by strong emotions rather than by reasoning. And so, why did God make love stronger than the principle? You might think, well, one way God could have prevented the fall was by simply making a rule so strong that they had no choice but to come to God. And this, of course, would result in the creating of more or less robots. And so love is motive and purpose for creation of humanity in the universe. It's the source of life and happiness. And for love to fulfill its role, it has to be the supreme power. You know, years ago, the late Sir Winston Churchill made a statement about democracy. He said, you know, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. What is the meaning of that? It means that it's the best system we have. It gives the greatest freedom to achieve our goals and so on. But it is yet very far from an ideal system. And any system which depends on laws, rules and regulations is obviously not ideal. Because ultimately, the highest way to govern a human being or to govern anything is through love. And therefore, God meant that human beings should be governed not by laws, not by Ten Commandments, or any other commandments, but by love itself. And so that man and they would act out of that love and in response to that love from God. For example, when Jesus was asked this question, you know, there are many, many rules and so on in the Mosaic Law, he was asked which among all of those is the most important. His answer was quite simple. He said that, the, first of all, love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And he concluded, therein lie all the laws and commandments. In other words, we don't need a list of rules and commandments, ideally. Ideally, God wants to rule us through love. And so he instituted the 
principle that actually love is the supreme power, is the supreme law. And that if the first ancestors had reached that level, they would then have experienced that love. And that is what would have guided them to be righteous, to be true, to be faithful. In other words, he wants to be of love over human beings. That is the great, the great beauty of God, is that indeed, he wants us to be enveloped in a way, in this uh, divine love. And so, because uh, during their growing period, Adam and Eve had not yet reached that level of love in their relationship with God, there was the possibility that they could fall. There was a certain vulnerable period when they were still immature, they were still growing. And so they were, in a way, following or trying to follow the command of God, but you know, vulnerable to uh, some force from outside. And uh, this could be a force of unprincipled love. And so we can say that indeed, uh, before perfection, there was that possibility of human beings falling. And however, after perfection, of course, God intended that there would be no possibility of them returning again. They would simply not want to. They, were, they would be fully content, fully uh, complete in their heart, and would not need or would not have a desire even to go anywhere other than the realm of God's love. And so the possibility of the fall was during that period of growing to perfection. So if a force of unprincipled love were to enter, uh, then the possibility indeed was there for Adam and Eve to deviate. And so they had to stand very firmly on principle. Even if emotionally they were being turned in another direction, they had to keep very strongly to the conviction that the command of God and that the direction of God was right. Even if they didn't fully yet appreciate why that command was so important. And so the, the vulnerable time in their development was, of course, during this period of what we call indirect dominion. So now the question is, why did God give the commandment? Why was the commandment necessary? It's said simply to prevent the fall. And so if Adam and Eve had trusted the word of God, and obeyed the commandment. In other words, do not eat. In other words, trust the principle and obey the commandment of God. Together, they would have been able to repel the force of unprincipled love. In other words, only the combined following of principle and the commandment would ensure that Adam and Eve would not have taken the wrong direction. And so, in other words, the, uh, the uh, commandment was a wall of protection for Adam and Eve had they obeyed that command. And then they would have reached perfection. The force of unprincipled love would not have been able to enter into this relationship. And so, <clears throat> why did God give the commandment? Again, this is another very important issue. It's to have human beings, to have dominion over the natural world, including angels. He wanted human beings to grow and to become those who will finally inherit God's blessing. And that would be possible because of the effort that they themselves also would have made. And so by, fulfilling, by helping to perfect themselves through fulfilling their responsibility, they were in a position to have certain inheritance rights, if I put it that way. And they would have also the, children, this, the dignity of children of God. And they would have made that choice freely. And therefore, the relationship between God and his children would have been one of a mature and uh, conscious decision by his own children to come into the bosom of God's direct dominion and love. And so the commandment was a temporary measure until Adam and Eve had made that choice, made the right choice, hopefully. Did freedom cause the fall? Of course, you could say that if they were created as robots, they couldn't have fallen. But is that what God wanted to have? Do, do parents want to have robotic children? Anybody here who has or would like to have children want to have robotic children? Uh, I don't think so. You might like to play around with robots sometimes if you meet them. But I don't suppose you'd like your children to be like that, right? And so the question is, did freedom cause the fall? So what is true freedom? Free will is to be followed by free action. In other words, you are given the freedom to make a choice and to act in a certain way. 
Freedom means also in this case free within the principle. In other words, that by following this principle you attain this perfection. There is no freedom also without responsibility. And that's unfortunately one of the things that we often forget, that uh, we can have li a licentious lifestyle and think there are no results or consequences. And so there is also no freedom without accomplishments. In other words, within the scope of the freedom that we have, we also should actually accomplish. And in this case, we're talking here about how Adam and Eve were meant to develop as the children of God. They were meant to perfect themselves, utilizing that free choice. And in the process, demonstrating to God their devotion to God and their conviction as God's children. Now, there are some limits to freedom. For example, uh, if you decide that you do not believe in gravity anymore, that's fine to have that belief, and you're free to believe that, of course. And you're free also to walk to the edge of the Dover Cliffs, right? And try to walk to France. But you'll discover you will not get very far. In fact, you'll get no further than the base of the cliffs. Uh, many, many hundreds of feet down, perhaps. So you will never make it to France. As much as you believe in freedom uh, to defy gravity. So, of course, what happens here is that uh, you, know, you lose your freedom when you violate the principle. And so, in this case, you also you have the issue of gravity. Uh, gravity takes over once you step over the cliff. And so, in the case of Adam and Eve, they lost their freedom once they stepped beyond the border of the principle in God's command. In other words, since Eve's heart and intellect were still immature when she was tempted by the angels, she became confused emotionally and intellectually. Although the freedom of her original mind induced in her a sense of foreboding, she crossed the boundary and fell. And so this is, of course, a, a real issue, a problem, that where Eve no longer was free once she had stepped across the boundary. And so how would the commandment work? And again, I quote from the Divine Principle, No matter how freely Eve related to the angel, if she had maintained faith in the commandment and not responded to the temptation, then the power of unprincipled love would not have been generated and she would not have fallen. So even though there was a, a feeling of temptation coming towards Eve, if she maintained her conviction on the principle, then of course she would have rejected any uh, unrighteous uh, approaches by the archangel. And uh, there would have been no relationship possible. The archangel, in fact, would have been protected from himself. After all, we, we point out that humans are in a position higher than angels. So, in fact, they were meant even to protect Lucifer from himself. So if, he, if they had obeyed the principle and rejected Lucifer, that would have been good for him, as well as for themselves and, of course, for the whole province. And so, how was the fall possible? Again, this is a very... Uh, big question which uh, uh, has caused I'm sure a lot of theological debate throughout the centuries so as I mentioned earlier God wanted his ch wanted children not robots so in the process of growing obviously there was that period of vulnerability there was the period where they could in fact take a wrong direction unfortunately they did and again, God wanted relationships of love, not simple obedience in the sense of w without a choice. Um, also, love has to be freely and spontaneously given. Uh, if somebody is in a position where they are forced to respond to you and they don't have a choice, that is not a very exciting relationship. You certainly will not find joy in such a relationship. Joy comes when, when love is freely uh, reciprocated in a relationship. I remember seeing some a kind of a poster, I think it was, in America one time, where uh, a man was, was, I think it was a card you could write to your wife, perhaps, or husband. And uh, let's say it was a husband to his wife. And uh, the words stuck in my mind because I thought they were very beautiful. And it said that, you are great because you are a human being. You are great because you are free. But the greatest thing about you is that with that freedom, you choose me. 
Wouldn't you like to get a car like that from your husband? Or your wife? <laughs> right. So, in other words, that out of the three, well now, three and a half billion women or men in the world, they choose you. And so, that is the beauty of love. And that with, this, with all this freedom, they choose, they choose you. And likewise with God, that uh, even if there was some t- unrighteous temptation coming towards them from any direction, they would still choose to stay on the principal path and uh, develop their oneness with God. And so God therefore gave his children this freedom uh, in order to give the relationship of love meaning. Without, again, it's, it's, we're in many ways saying the same thing from a whole uh, different points of view. And so with freedom also comes the possibility of evil, of, of the going wrong. And so if when you, for example, love somebody, means you give your heart to them. In so doing, you're putting yourself out there with the possibility of betrayal. So you are making yourself vulnerable. And that is the nature of love. When God created human beings, God entrusted his love to human beings. In fact, how much did God give us His love? First of all, as we see with Adam and Eve, He trusted them to grow into maturity. He trusted them with the biological capacity to procreate God's children on that foundation. Even God, you know, gave us that kind of possibility. So in other words, He entrusted us an enormous amount of uh, uh, hope and trust and in the beginning, unfortunately, this was betrayed. And so you might uh, wonder, as many people do, I'm sure, why didn't God intervene and to deal with this issue? Why didn't God uh, get involved and decide, okay, I can see they're going in the wrong direction, I'm going to now intervene and uh, interfere with the situation. So God would not violate the principle. So humans, to reach maturity, through, they do so through fulfilling their responsibility. For the, as we said so many times earlier, that uh, to give meaning to the relationship, there must be this freedom, and the freedom has responsibility. And so they also need to grow in the realm of indirect dominion. It's like all of us, those of us uh, who are parents, for example, you know, we have children, they're born, they're helpless at the very outset, but over time they begin to grow. And even at the age of three, they are much more mature than they were when they were just born. However, you would not be able to talk to your child, three-year-old child about things which, you know, is, is, is you know, very serious or weighing on your heart. They are simply not able to comprehend, even if you do talk to them. So, you have to talk to them, in a sense, indirectly, through stories, through tales, and in a childish sort of way. And so, likewise, God could not communicate with his own children until they had reached this level of maturity where they could comprehend God's heart. Just like a child cannot be spoken to on issue, certain issues until they have matured enough and are ready to understand what your parent is trying to say. And so, if God intervened, he would be ignoring that responsibility and also his own principle. So it's like he would be taking away the responsibility and the freedom from Adam and Eve and also violating his own principle. And God will never do that. So God alone is the creator. This is also an important point as to why God didn't intervene. So whatever God relates to has the value of being acknowledged by God. So God was not responsible for the actions of the archangel. If the archangel had been following God's will, and if Adam and Eve had been following God's will, evil would not have come into existence it came into existence as a result of their violation of principle, which has nothing to do with God. Of course, as a parent, as the parent, God feels responsible because he created this world. He created all human beings. He created the archangel Lucifer. Therefore, in his heart, fundamentally God feels responsible. But he can't directly touch evil. That is not something he created. Touching it would give it the level of something that he created. For example, in the modern world, you had uh, the issue of terrorism, right? And so many times governments are confronted with this situation, and many times these terrorists, they want to be recognized 
as a legitimate opposition, even by using violent methods. If governments accept that, it means they're acknowledging that. They cannot do that. Likewise, in the beginning of history, God could not acknowledge the evil act. To do so would have given it recognition as something on an equal footing as the rest of his creation. And so, in other words, he would have been dignifying those actions as part of his world. This he cannot do. Satan would have become the crea like a co-creator of a new principle. In other words, God would have given Satan himself a certain level of recognition which he certainly does not deserve and did not deserve. And so, as painful as it is for God to work throughout history to save man, that is the price that is being paid for God to work within his own principle to restore man, as we will hear in the coming lectures. And so also, another reason why God didn't intervene is to make human beings lords of creation. The reason we were given a portion of responsibility and a time period within which to grow was in order that we could actually mature ourselves and have the right of inheritance, the right to receive God's inheritance. And so humans, as distinct from other creatures, were the only ones with this uh, portion of responsibility, which would then, if they fulfilled their responsibility, give them the right to rule over the creation. When uh, you study the story in Genesis about the creation, you will notice that God didn't go around uh, with Adam and Eve and saying, hey, Adam, come here. You know, there's an elephant, okay? Do you remember that word, elephant? Okay, there's a mouse. Mouse, M-O-U-S-E. And God didn't pre-name, apparently, his creation. As the story is told, which uh, I think is an indication of God's heart, he was giving the responsibility to Adam and Eve to name the creation. Why? Because he was inheriting it to them. And therefore they could choose how to uh, name the creatures. Also, gain qualification by inheriting God's character and creativity. Again, Obviously, God, having created a whole universe, is a very creative being. And so, he wanted Adam and Eve also to inherit that nature through the process of growth. And so, they had to fulfill responsibility by themselves. God could not intervene. After all, the question is, if he could, why hasn't he done it until now? If that was the answer, he would have done it. We can have no doubt about this. God would have resolved the problem a long time ago if he could just have interfered, just like that. So there are very good reasons why he could not intervene. And actually, on this issue, this took Reverend Moon 14 years of prayer and study and countless tears to get some basic answers. Most of the principle he discovered in a period of nine years. This took 14 years. This is one of the most crucial points, actually, to, that he had to discover. And so, again, the oft-asked question is, why didn't God prevent the fall? Why didn't he prevent it? If he foresaw it, then surely he must have wanted to do that. And again, as the question comes up to many people, is, uh, is God all-knowing to the point where he can see everything that inevitably is going to happen? Was the fall predestined? These kinds of questions are big issues. And if God were to foresee that there is no other destiny except the fall of man, why then didn't he interfere? Or better, why did he even bother to create with a world of suffering that has resulted? So these are critical questions. And so God gave the commandment because God wanted to get the message to his children without interfering in their freedom and their responsibility. The commandment was put there. It wasn't God interfering. He was simply giving them clear guidance, but the choice was still theirs. God respects us. God trusted us. In a relationship of love, that has to be so. And so, we can look at the story, for example, of the prodigal son. I think you're familiar with that story. When the younger son came to the father and said, look, at, I, um, you know, I have decided I need to get my inheritance and go on out and uh, do my own thing. The father didn't stop the son from doing that. 
The son went away and, as the story goes, squandered his inheritance on sinful living to the point where, in the end, he would have been happy to eat the pig's food that, of the pigs he was taking care of. And so, finally, he came to his senses, as the story goes. He repented and he said, I will go back to my father's home where even the servants eat far better and live far better than I do here. And so with a repentful heart, he returned, of course, to his uh, father. And so the father embraced him and welcomed him back and had a banquet and so on and so forth. So the point here, the main point that I want to emphasize here is that the father, when the son made a decision, the father did not intervene. Even though I'm sure the father was quite aware, this boy is a little mature, and he could mess up. And of course he did. And so, he, but nonetheless, God did not prevent him from going that direction. And uh, once the son recognized his mistake and repented, then of course the father was ready to welcome him back, to embrace him again. And so, evil sin and Satan, Scott Peck, the American psychologist who has written uh, People of the Lie, said, Satan is the real spirit of lies. Although intangible and immaterial, it has a personality, a true being. Pervading this personality is an active presence of hate. So some of the most uh, you know, uh, successful writers and uh, people you know, in history have, have, have concluded that indeed there is such a being. It is not a mythical story. C.S. Lewis in his famous uh, Screwtape Letter said, Satan's greatest deception is to persuade people that he does not exist. Now that is a problem, isn't it? It's like you are fighting an enemy you don't see and who may have convinced you he simply doesn't exist. It's very difficult dealing with that kind of enemy. You know, so uh, this indeed has been one of the great tactics. Not only does Satan actually convince many people that he doesn't exist, he's also convinced many people that God doesn't exist. Now, Satan is many, many bad things. Don't you agree? But there is one thing which he is not. Do you know what that is? He is not an atheist. Do you think Satan believes in God? Yes. Absolutely. And that's part of the problem also. Is because he knows God better than we do. After all, he was the archangel Lucifer. He was entrusted by God with a lot of insights, I'm sure, and a lot of knowledge, which was necessary for him to fulfill his role. And so he took all that knowledge with him. And so one of the people that can become your worst enemy is the one who knows more about you. And they can maybe predict you or something like this. And so Satan surely does believe in God. A lot of people don't, but Satan does. And that's why... God has constantly had to wrestle with that reality. And so, on the one hand, his worst enemy believes in him, whereas his own children have lost faith in him. Do not believe in him. How easy it is then to fool human beings. That's the reality of the work of Satan. And so all people are affected by the fall. <clears throat> so original sin is transmitted through the physical body. In which way? Because the original sin was a sexual sin, which of course had two parts, the spiritual fall Eve and the archangel Lucifer and the physical fall between uh, Adam and Eve and Adam right? and then out of that was born of course the next and all succeeding generations there's a direct blood lineage connection right back to the original spiritual fall there were no descendants from the relationship between Eve and the archangel that's not possible but the elements, the evil elements, were transmitted from Lucifer to Eve, to Adam, to their descendants. And we are still the victims of this fall. And so, in other words, we inherited original sin. And so this is the great misfortune of human beings. And yet, until now, it has not been explained clear, clearly about why innocent babies are still born with original sin. They haven't had a chance to act and to do anything. Yet they are born inheriting this sin. And so we inherited this contradictory nature. On the one hand we have 
the inclination towards goodness. In other words, what we call our original nature, leading us towards God and goodness. On the other hand, the evil inclination, leading us, our fallen nature, leading us towards evil. Unfortunately, the percentage of fallen nature or the percentage of evil far outweighs the percentage of goodness. And the inclination towards evil, therefore, is much, much stronger. So it is far easier in this world, in our life, to choose the wrong path. Because everywhere, the, the standards of Satan have infiltrated this world. And whether it's coming through the internet or through all, all kinds of media, people around us with fallen minds, fallen attitudes, fallen behavior, we are uh, being constantly, constantly bombarded by this. And so this has been the pain of God to try to create a world or extricate people out of such an environment. And so what is sin? You know, this is again uh, a, a big question I, because various cultures have defined this issue like good and evil in different ways according to their perspectives, their cultures and so on. So sin, is, a, according to the divine principle, is a thought or deed which violates heavenly law so that one forms a relationship with Satan. In other words, if we commit any act which violates the heavenly law and allows Satan to point this out based on principle, then we have committed sin. If you think about Satan as the prosecuting attorney, you know, he's the one who prosecutes you in front of God or in front of the heavenly constitution, right? What does that mean? He can only do that based on the law. Satan can't prosecute you outside of the principle. So the moment you step outside the principle, using the principle, which he knows, he can say, you have violated. That's why in the scripture, Satan is referred to as an accuser, and he accuses God's children day and night. And so people feel this accusation in a subconscious way, and have a feeling of guilt and shame, and this constantly bothers people. They can't be free. The only way we can be free, as Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In other words, when we actually learn clearly what is the right way to go, we absolutely adhere to that path without any false step, then we will be free. And Satan can come and say what he wants, and say, by principle, you cannot accuse me. You have no right to accuse me, because I know the principle, I know the right way to go. So get lost. Like Jesus when he was being tempted in the desert, right? Jesus responded in each case by principle. All his answers were very carefully crafted to represent principle. He didn't say one word which Satan could catch him on. And finally Satan had to disappear. And so one of the great benefits of this teaching is that we are being given the tool in our hands to defend ourselves, to protect ourselves, and to be able to know our enemy. Our enemy was the creature that was closest to God before the creation of man. And he took this knowledge with him, and he used it against God's children. That's why we as God's children have to know this, and we have to utilize this to finally reject Satan's attempts to crush us. And so good and evil are determined by motivation, direction, purpose, and also consequences. In other words, sometimes it's hard to see when something is good or evil, unless you understand motivation. It's like uh, supposing you see somebody running, you know, running along, let's say you're out one day walking and enjoying the weather, and then you see one guy chasing another, right? And the guy chasing has this big baseball bat. And he's running after this other guy. And suddenly he smashes into him and breaks his legs. You think, oh my God. And you go up there and you grab the guy. What did you do that for? And from your point of view, it's very clear. He was trying to kill this guy. But then you discover this guy was running to the edge of the cliff over there to commit suicide. And the only way he could stop him was by breaking his legs. How does it look then? Motivation looks quite different, huh? So, he's not trying to hurt him, actually. He's trying to save him. 
You know, so in other words, when Jesus said we should turn the other cheek, he didn't mean that we should be, you know, like a doormat, but that we should uh, keep a single mind. And even if people persecute us, for their sake even, we will take it on the other cheek and we will continue on our path. And so motivation is really an important issue. So what types of sin are there? As a Catholic growing up in Ireland, you know, we had what we call mortal sin, which means that if you died before you confessed, you went straight down to hell, the burning fires of hell. Thank God for that. It helped me a lot, actually, because I didn't want to go there. Then there was venial sin. Well, venial sin is kind of, uh, well, of course, if you die before you confess it, you then put in a waiting room before you can get into heaven. So it's kind of, you know, you was like stuck at a bus station. You can't quite get to your destination. And you have to do something to get yourself free from it. But at least the place was probably comfortably warm, not burning hot. And so what types of sin are there? We see several types here. First of all, original sin. Then the original sin, of course, is what we inherit, something that we have no control over, we have no choice over. Inherited sin is also something we actually cannot control because we inherit it. For example, did you decide uh, to be born? Anybody? Or where to be born? Or to which parents to be born? Right. So some very fundamental things happen in our life over which we have no choice, and one of them is being born. And so we are blessed or burdened by the family we're born into, the nation we're born into, the time we're born. You know, so which affect us like whether you were born a hundred or a thousand years ago, we were born ten years ago, or the country in which you were born. Maybe you were unlucky enough to be born into a, a Cambodia just before the, the the Pol Pot destroyed millions of people, and you were one of the victims. You're just bad timing, and so. Many things we cannot control about uh, this. So, for example, with sin, original sin is something that simply passes down through our lineage because we are directly connected to Adam and Eve, even in our physical lineage. Inherited sin is something that maybe is a fault or some kind of an issue maybe for your nation uh, or in your particular lineage. Maybe there's some particular weakness for gambling, for alcoholism. Uh, maybe there was some, your ancestors committed some very serious violations and, and hurt other people, killed other people. And so then you have inherited this, uh, this uh, debt in a way. Collective sin. Again, you know, there's a situation where maybe our nation has violated uh, another nation. And so we may be looked upon and uh, persecuted for being from that nation. So we pay a collective price for my country's mistakes in the past. I think that uh, you know, in the last war, you know, even today, there's still uh, some residue of resentment towards the major Axis nations in certain parts of the world. Certainly, when I was visiting China, they never forget reminding us about the terrible Japanese. Or in Russia, they still talk about the fascists as if it was just yesterday. And so... Uh, obviously in some countries they still hang on to their resentment towards the nation. So even the fact that you had nothing to do with it, but you come from that nation, you know, then you, in a sense, are paying the price as part of your nation uh, for that mistake. And of course there's personal sin. We each understand that we have made mistakes. We violate principle, we act selfishly, and therefore we uh, collect personal sin. And so this basically is our tree of sin. And so we can work to solve you know, the last three months here, the personal, collective, or inheritable sin. And so we can try to you know, resolve this by our efforts. For example, we can stop sinning as an individual. We can decide, this is a habit I will discontinue. I will set my life straight. I will repent. I will start uh, training myself to act differently. Uh, collective sin. Maybe we can take a look at where maybe my nation, my race, or whatever, has violated uh, others, and make amends to those, or the descendants of those, who suffered as a result of my ancestors' mistakes. Or also the inheritable sin. 
There are certain bad habits which we inherit. I want to change those in myself so that my children do not inherit those. However, original sin is something we cannot touch. It is beyond our control. It is beyond our capacity to solve. And that's why the Messiah comes to solve the root of sin. So Messiah must come to end original sin and create, in a sense, a new lineage separated from the fallen age from the time of Adam and Eve. And so let's take a look now at what is fallen nature because we do have fallen nature as a result of our, uh, of our first ancestor's sin. So it is wrongly directed original nature passed from Lucifer to Eve, from fallen Eve to Adam, and from both of them to all of their descendants. So it's like a twisting of the original nature. Just as Lucifer twisted the direction of God and fooled Eve by a half-truth in order to get her to fall with him. And so there are four basic fallen natures. First is not seeing or loving as God does. So when the archangel Lucifer saw Adam and Eve being created, and probably helped with that even, uh, and, but as he saw them growing closer and closer to God, and being in a position to relate to God in a different way, he should have tried to understand the heart of God and the love of God towards Adam and Eve. And he should have felt it was his honor and privilege to serve God in raising up his children. If I refer back to the prodigal son story, which we just mentioned earlier, the mistake of the elder son, who did not go away, was not that he actually was doing anything wrong. He was very obedient to his father. He stayed with his father. But obviously he did not know his father's heart, because when his father wanted to make this banquet for the wayward son, he started complaining. You want to give all this banquet for the son that has messed up his life, whereas I, who have always been with you and never did that, you never had a banquet for me. What does that tell us about the elder son? That he was not, he did not understand his father's heart. If he did, he would have gone out and brought back his brother, because that son, younger son, the elder son, would have recognized the anguish of his father over his missing younger son. And if he loved his father truly, how could he let his father suffer? He would have said, Dad, okay, just give me time. I'll go out there and I'll find this young boy. I'll bring him back to you. That would be the right thing to do. So the point here is that the archangel Lucifer should have really understood the love of God towards Adam and Eve. It was very beautiful, very special. Out of love, his love for God and his respect and sense of obedience and, and obligation to God, he then could have said, God, I will, you want me to be like a teacher, an instructor, or you know, somehow guide them? I will happily do so. I will do so. That is the way Lucifer should have served Adam and Eve. In other words, taking the viewpoint of God towards Adam and Eve. Love them in a way as God loved them. And then helped to raise them up. And so rather than having that attitude, actually he took another approach. He began to compare his relationship with God before the fall with Adam and Eve's relationship to God, I mean, before the creation of Adam and Eve, with the relationship God had with Adam and Eve when they arrived. He realized they were going to be the direct children of God. Their love of God was new and had a unique quality. And Lucifer rather felt envious of this. However, if he had followed God's hope and actually serve them, through them he would have received the love and gratitude of God. They would surely have more than compensated for any feeling of loss of love in his heart. Because God did not want any creature to feel a lack of love. And so he had prepared everything that each would have been fulfilled. Each would have been satisfied. And so the archangel did not respect uh, Adam as God's mediator and did not receive love through him. So and there was a second fall in nature here was to leave one's proper position, feeling, why should I have to receive God's love through Adam and Eve? This is not really necessary. And so he then left his position and tried to establish himself, of course, in a different position in relation to Adam and Eve and in relation to God. In other words, he reversed the order of dominion, decided 
But uh, I want to take the position again where I am the one closer to God and even God's children, Adam and Eve, should come to me. Of course, that is a totally unprincipled uh, desire and unprincipled relationship and would simply sever Adam and Eve from their relationship with God. And so the archangel claimed dominion over Adam and Eve who were to be his rightful lords. Rather than serving them, he took the position of master over them. And so the nature in human beings of being arrogant or exploitative is actually part of that character coming from Lucifer. And finally, the fourth is multiplication of sin. And so we have a situation here where uh, the evil word, in a way, went from Lucifer, fooled and trapped Eve, and then Eve pulled Adam into this uh, vortex, and they all went down. And so all of uh, human beings got caught up in this situation. And so the tendency of a person to spread lies and to multiply uh, negativity or wrong uh, information is a part of that nature. Also, people often, you have the expression, it's often the case with young people that, uh, well, everybody is doing it, so what's wrong with that? You know, the kids come home from school and say, so what's wrong? Okay, I start smoking, so what's wrong? Everybody's doing it. The parents and I say, well, it's not good for your health. But everybody's doing it, mummy. You know? And so the idea that, uh, you know, you can actually do it simply because everybody else is doing it. And so also the idea of implicating others. Uh, Lucifer pulled Eve away from God into his sort of spider's web. And then Eve also pulled Adam away from God into that fallen uh, relationship. And so how do Satan influence us? Satan is a real being, uh, like uh, Scott Peck pointed out, is a real entity. And he works through his cohorts, which are evil angels, angels that have fallen, and evil spirits, those who are actually with him. When the fall took place, one of the statements that you will read is, God spoke to the serpent, right? And he said, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life, right? What is the meaning of dust? Dust means the evil spiritual elements of people doing wrong things. In other words, Satan exists through eating dirt. Dirt is the sin of human beings. So he's empowered as long as we commit sin and have given take with him. We empower Satan. If you think about like the dictator Stalin or Hitler, right? as long as there were people ready to carry out their commands, they were empowered. Once people abandoned them, they were completely powerless. Likewise, on a cosmic level, Satan can only have power if human beings give him that power, or if evil spirits in the spiritual world give him that power. And so the way it works here is that Satan inspires or encourages evil thoughts or actions through an evil spirit, which then influences our spiritual bodies. So we get strong sort of urge, maybe to do something wrong. Sometimes people get overwhelming urges to be promiscuous. They can't control it. Or to steal or to commit some other kind of uh, wrong act. And what is happening is they're often overwhelmed by spiritual power at the urging of Satan. And then our body is in a way pushed into sin. We are actually committing some act which is a violation of principle. And so evil thoughts, words and actions then emerge from a person under that kind of pressure. And so we are in a sense in a midway position where we can be influenced either by good or by evil spirits. So God, of course, wants to work with us and through us by influencing us also through good spirits. There are good angels and there are good spirits in the spirit world. All the saints are among those leading spirits. So they want to influence us towards goodness. So in various ways, we get this silent voice guiding us. And uh, this tends to lead towards greater health, towards a nature which is more unselfish, a more peaceful environment, and a person or an environment which is more harmonious and happy. On the other hand, you can often detect, in a way, the presence of evil through uh, the misfortunes that surround us. Sometimes uh, it is sickness. In fact, uh, 
people, spiritual people, say that uh, something like 90%, I think, of the sicknesses that uh, we have to deal with are, have a spiritual cause. And so it is like they, they are actually influencing our physical body, trying to damage us and destroy us. Also, the nature to be selfish, of course, comes from that. Feelings of guilt and also an environment of conflict. So whenever you're dealing with a spiritual doubt, you might, you might sometimes have a situation where you feel some spiritual power. The One of the ways you can know whether that's from, from God or from evil is if that spiritual power is uh, selfless, leads you towards a selfless attitude. If, if it's divisive, then you have to avoid the spirit. That's why, for example, in the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, right? For they shall be called the sons of God, right? And if it was the reverse, what would he have said? Cursed are the warmongers. They shall be called the sons of Satan, right? In other words, anything which leads towards, towards true peace, harmony, unselfish behavior, you know, where you try to create an environment of peace and harmony, that is the work of God. So, for example, if we spread bad words about people, or we cause division, that's the work of Satan. If we speak badly of others in a way which is divisive and has no good purpose, there are times you have to talk about people's shortcomings and so on, but it must be done in a, in a caring and responsible way, where you're actually trying to understand them and help them. But if you know something about somebody where they are something wrong, they've made a mistake, but then you maliciously spread that. Even though you're telling the truth, but your heart is to cause division, that is, you're not a peacemaker. You are doing the work of Satan, causing division. And so we have to, in a way, be aware in ourselves how to be a son of God, how to be a daughter of God. And so we need, in that sense, to separate from Satan. In other words, we have to be able to deny the overwhelming power of uh, Satan's uh, spiritual power, which is very powerful, in order to be able to uh, separate ourselves from Satan. In other words, we do not allow our spirit to be seduced by wrong thoughts, by wrong deeds, by wrong actions, by wrong words. It's very easy to be seduced by somebody speaking negatively about somebody else. We have the gossip. You know the gossip? Easily we gossip. And so that's one of the ways that Satan divides people. If, on the other hand, we really just simply cut off from that, and we only want to... It doesn't mean you ignore reality, but it means that you do not want to gossip. I remember one of my priests in school, he gave a sermon, which I, to this day, still remember more than 40 years later. Uh, and he said, when somebody comes to you and says, well, I don't really, I shouldn't really be saying this, but, he said, right there, say it, stop. Not one more word. I don't want to hear what you're going to say. He said, stop them immediately and tell them to get lost. Because I really don't want to tell you this, but, well, then why are they telling you? Just tell them to stop. And so, because we do, and it's unfortunate, we have developed sometimes the habit of multiplying the negative and therefore feeding this monstrous serpent his meal of dust. And so if we cut off from any kind of tendency towards that, then we free ourselves from that influence and actually we have good thoughts, good actions and we believe the best in people and we look for the best. After all, God is not looking to find what's wrong with us. Like uh, Sometimes in religion people have been brought up to feel that God is waiting to pounce on you the moment you make a mistake. That's a strange God, a strange parent. Every parent wants to see what is good in their children. Every true parent wants to see what's good. So they're looking for reasons to actually compliment their children, to highlight how my kid is really good, even though maybe they have many other mistakes. But ah, that, look at that, he did that, it's so wonderful. That's my boy, you know. That's my girl. So a parent's heart is always to look for what's good, what's positive, what's uplifting. Eh? Satan's way is completely the opposite. So if we hear that voice telling us, uh, having, helping us to be critical and wanting to pull down others, we're in the wrong place. We've got a bit of repenting to do. And we've got to change our 
attitude. And so then we can really return to being sons and daughters of God and the peacemakers that Jesus spoke about. And so in next week's presentation, we will take a look at this issue of how has God been restoring the fall? The great good news is that God did not abandon us. God is committed eternally to his children. Eternally. No end. God is committed to saving his children. He will outlast Satan and evil, and he will eventually solve this whole issue of evil. So there's not even a speck of evil in the cosmos. That is the commitment of God to save his children. So God deserves a round of applause, I think. Thank you very much for being here this evening and uh, I hope that you found the presentation to be helpful. And please come back next week. Those of you who are watching through Ustream, uh, William Haynes will be back next week and we'll continue on this question. And I'm sure that you'll find it very, very interesting. And those of you who came here to Lancaster Gate, God bless you and have a safe trip home. <laughs>